episode three. Can't believe we've made episode three of Hearn and Bell, You Talk the Talk, fresh off the back of the Boris Johnson speech, which we're all trying to make sense of. But one thing we do know is we're probably going to be indoors for a few more weeks. So we, this is episode three. Tone, I think we're going to do six weeks of this, six episodes. Okay. I think it's not, it's not too bad. I mean, I told you, I think it was just a one-off for Zoom once, but you've been roped in now to six episodes. The numbers <laughs> are good. A couple of great guests today, Dillian White, Darren Till. Of course, a lot of talk of the boxing and UFC crossover. UFC got off the ground at the weekend. I have spoke to Dana White, I must say, a couple of times just to give him a little bit of encouragement because obviously I'm a big role model of his. Um, <laughs> that's funny, mate. I don't, I don't get it. But Dillian White Tone, obviously WBC interim world champion, become a little yeah. bit of a people's champion now. Seems to have gone on and and fought many contenders, and everyone feels like he's really deserving of that shot now at the title. He, he has, mate. He's captured the public's imagination with the way he's gone about his business. Ever since the AJ loss, he's, he's regrouped, he's rebounded, and, and he's just fought anyone and everyone else. He's a man who really deserves a title shot, uh, and no one can deny him that. You know, he just fights anyone, anywhere. Now he's up against Alexander Ovechkin, another former uh, world champion, and uh, he goes again, mate. So I, I fancy him hugely going into the Pavekin fight uh, by knockout for me, and I think within eight rounds. You know the funny thing about Dillian is he's literally always ready to go, isn't he? I remember when you were you were like still fighting, you were like, "I'll fight Dillian." I think you said something, and he said something. Yeah, I know what both of you were like, but he is literally like. There's been a couple of times I remember with um, Big Baby Miller when he was going to come over for a fight, and he's like, "Just to let you know, when I see him." <laughs> no, no, no. And this was like at the press conference. <laughs> like, yeah, obviously, you both, no, no, no. As soon as I see him, I'm going to set up on I'm putting him. Putting it on him. Yeah, no. <laughs> it doesn't surprise me. That's just Dillian all over. I mean, me and my banter when I was fighting after I beat Hay, I remember them saying to me, you beat a one-legged man. And I was back and forth with him, giving him a stick. But you know, one thing I've always uh, realised about Dillian is he's honest and he's real. He's just straight to the point. No messing around with him. Uh, and after I got on, he started to support me. I supported him. And we just get on well, mate. I say we speak uh, sometimes on the phone. Dylan is just someone who wants to fight. And that's the most important thing. Ed. He just wants to fight, mate. And he will fight anyone. There's been fights that he's taken that I don't agree with sometimes. That I've said to him, what are you doing? You don't need that fight right now. You're on the verge of a world title. I Tone, I need to fight. I've got to stay busy. Very few fights are like that. Ed. You know more than anyone. Fighters today are so happy to pick and choose the weaker, the weaker ones who are fighting. This lad just goes in fight after fight, and it's just you know it's unbelievable. The Ortiz fight uh, was unbelievable. Wait there, yes it is. What that was his, what was his name? The kid in the O2. A Rivas. Rivas, that Rivas fight mate was just mm -hmm. unbelievable. You know the way he comes back. He, he fights Parker when he probably shouldn't really fight Parker. He goes back in with Del Boy after having the first fight as bad as it was when. He needed the Del Boy fight, but you know he didn't have to take it. Let's be honest. Uh, he just fights anyone and, and any and everyone, mate. And and now he's trying to chase AJ again to, to try and get that win back uh, after the loss. But there's so many different things that I think he should do and shouldn't do. But the main thing is he fights anyone and everyone. And I, and I know for a fact you wish you had more fighters like him yeah. because if you did, your job be so much easier. Throwback, throwback fight, and of course, Fight Sports returned at the weekend with the UFC. We've spoken about it. Your thoughts. I think it's quite compelling. I, on a serious note, I did say to Dana White following the fight, it, it, I found the eeriness of the arena quite compelling. Like you said, you know, you, you hear a lot more. You can hear the shots landing. You can almost hear and feel the fighters breathing as well during the live broadcast. It was crazy to watch. As I said, you know, the, the big difference for me was you can hear them breathing. And you know, you it's one, you know, you can bluff your way through fights now and again. If you're a little bit tired, you can, you know, take a back step and your your breath will come back gradually. But when I can literally hear you breathing, mate, you know someone's blowing. You only have to put it on them and you know you've got them. So it was a it was a strange atmosphere. The fights were still fantastic. I mean, Gaethje and Ferguson was unbelievable. You know, I don't think uh, Tony Ferguson will ever be the same again after that. Uh, and Garner was pretty much a given. Uh, Mate, how much I'd love to see Dillian White against Francis Ngannou. I'm telling you now, Dillian White would just be unbelievable against Ngannou. It really because Ngannou can't wrestle. I think he'd do so, it. I think Dillian would do it. If it makes money, mate, it usually makes sense. So, 
you know, why not? That's what I would say. You know, if Dylan can can if Dylan's gonna get prolonged anymore for this WBC world title shot, then mate, go and have a fight with Francis Ngannou and probably double and probably double your net worth. Well, it's a scout invasion. We also have Darren Till on here tonight, who I've never met. I've never spoken to him. Every now and again, he calls me out on social media. So I think his latest one, I think he called me a prick or something like that. I can't remember what it is. Tell me about Darren Till. I mean, you like the difference is like you've grown up around these people in the area. So yeah. you know him better than anyone in terms of what people think of him. Darren Till, reading up on the on the notes that I've been sent today, bit got in a bit of trouble as as a as a youngster, went and lived in Brazil for three years. Yes. Right. And learned to speak Portuguese. Oh, uh, Darren's just one of the lads from Liverpool. As I said, there's not many ways out for us in Liverpool. Lad. You know, for lads like us and, and uh, the about the same thing. It's either, you know, football's the dream ticket. You know, it always has been. But if, if there's not that, then, it, you know, it's pick up gloves, pick up UFC, it's whatever you want, and have a fight or tell jokes. Or there's the other way around that we're not going to really talk on touch up on me. Yeah, but uh, the street life and Darren showed that he was good enough to pursue a career in the UFC through mixed martial arts and whatever have you. He got into a little bit of trouble. Uh, I think he got himself stabbed. Uh, something went wrong. Uh, I don't know the exact ins and outs, but I know he moved to Brazil and wants to learn his craft. I don't think it was so much as wanting to get away from our city. I think it's as everybody in and around the cave on stable knew how much ability he had. And it's one of them things, it's like, you know, when you're there, trainers here, and they go, well, you should go over age, to the States. That age, what do you have ability? You have ability just across the board of, in mixed martial arts, is that? He had, he, had, he had really good hands. He was a southpaw. He was knocking people out with, with kicks. Uh, he's a very, very good Muay Thai fighter. But it's like, you know, when <clears throat> in England, you always hear the old thing of, you've got to go over the States to really do it. Or you've got to go here. But there's, there's, there's still that kind of thing in, in mixed martial arts. It's all go to Brazil, go to here or there and see how the best jiu two guys work or see how the best wrestlers work in America. So I think you'd always have that old man syndrome in every sport. Like it has, say, in boxing, it's oh, go on, go over to the States, go over to New York and see what their gyms are like. No better than there, mate. The coaches are not better than there as well. So I think that and found that after spending three years in Brazil, he comes home, he comes back to Colin. This is his long-time coach in the Cabon stable. And he just, you know, he, he, he flourishes, mate. He He's goes done well. beyond. I, I kind of feel like, and again, this is like, I, I don't follow UFC full-time. We'll talk mm. about the card last night. I don't want to make this a UFC show, but he's one of the only sports on at the moment. But I kind of feel like he was on the verge of superstardom, Darren. Yeah. And, and he sort of slipped off the ladder a little bit. I mean, he's still young. He's got a big future. But yeah. one thing I want to talk to both of you about when you're on is about weight cutting. Because mm. you two are like, you know, oh, amazing in, in the group. I mean, the, the amount of weight and, and weight you two had to cut at times yeah. was probably quite similar. And I thought the way they documented it, one, I mean, it was brutal to watch, but it just shows oh, you the reality. And it's, I think it's even worse in UFC, don't you, than it is in yeah. in, Boston, in terms is. of the weight cut. Because they allow you to do it right out in the open. They allow you to go in the saunas. They allow you to just do whatever it takes to get the weight off in boxing. It's controlled and it's monitored. It, it's 3% on the week of the fight. It's 5% within a fortnight of the fight. In the UFC, mate, it's literally get down to 20 pounds of gold the night before the way and they're losing 20 pounds overnight. And it, it's dangerous, mate. It's very, very dangerous. And I think Darren <clears throat> is someone who, who's benefited massively now from a move up that he should have done a long time ago. But as I was doing, you get to a point at your weight division, like I was at 175, you've got your shot, you've got all the way there, you've gone to all the contenders. Now your, your shot's finally come. It just happens to be he's outgrown the division. Uh, and he also, let's be fair, he, could say he came up against a fantastic champion in Tyrone Woodley. Mm -hmm. Tyrone Woodley makes is one of the most explosive fights in the world. Very heavy-handed, very good on the ground, uh, extremely capable with his hands. Darren's only advantage in the fight was his size. And it's probably it's probably his legs, but they were taken away rapidly, mate. As I say, with with the weight cut, I don't believe Darren ever had five round, five full good rounds in him while he was making that weight. And I'm pretty sure he'll come on and tell us the same himself. But we'll soon see. But it's like me when I was making one seven five. I never ever had twelve good rounds in me. Yeah, I might have had beautiful. four or five. But I remember mate, when I remember I when you I remember when you got <clears throat> Ronnie Stevenson in Montreal. Uh, in Montreal, uh, yeah. where was it? Quebec. 
Yeah. I think it was fucking about minus 20 as well, wasn't it? And I, I, got out, yeah. <laughs> and I remember you came downstairs for the weigh-in and we sat in that little side room and you had your, you had your bomber hat on and your cheekbones yeah. were like literally like up here. And I just thought to myself, and, and every fight he said the same thing. All right, mate, how'd you make all right run away? Yeah, sound clear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'll ask you about making weight. Weird stuff, but... Yeah, a couple of questions on, go, go back to boxing now. Mm. With regards to the board rules about, you know, for anyone that doesn't know, you know, there'll be a check weight on the Wednesday and you have to be a certain, you know, amount of weight over Five your percent. championship weight. And then previously as well, the WBC also have their rules now with 28 days and seven days. Yeah. What, what do you think about it? Because sometimes we know what happens when yeah. you've got a check weight. You might, you know, you, you're not <laughs> to, out to make the weight and then you rehydrate. And it almost, does it give you a bigger problem coming into yeah. the Friday as well? I mean, when we talk about safety in boxing, the board are trying to be as safe as possible. And that's the reason they're implementing that. But can that actually work against them, do you think, in terms of fighters? Yeah. Because you, how many times would you have said, oh, I've got my check weight on Wednesday? You know, you, yeah. you're, you're working hard on Tuesday, maybe train Wednesday morning, turn up to the check weight, you know, oh, boom, 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 boom. boom. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, you've got to do it all again 48 hours later. In theory, they're trying to do the right thing. They're trying to make sure your weight comes down gradually and it's not one big crash from top to bottom. But by doing that, it, you, I don't want to say this, but I'm going to say it. They need more frequent check weigh-in. So I believe they should be, it should be a 10-week breakdown. What you are from three months out. It, this is only for title fights purely, in my opinion. Ed. So for title fights, I believe it should be between a 10 to 12-week breakdown. And for the fighters making weight, it should progressively see the weight coming down gradually. So if you are, let's just say some fighters are 10 weeks to go, a 30 pound over the weight. And that, that's pretty common for, for most fighters. Now, a 30 pound over the weight and you've got 10 weeks, do the maths, three pound a week. So sounds they should want to, yeah, it sounds <laughs> easy, but they should want to see that, that gradual decline in your weight. The, 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 but if they haven't got the time or the resources to do it, the board, I would suggest, you know, <clears throat> the area council from each area comes on and says, right, it's your time for this way on this day, that day, that day. And they do this the ways every, they wait every Friday and they want to see the fighters at the end of the week of every week and they want to see the gradual weight coming down. And, and if the, the weight doesn't come down over one week or they miss it or whatever, then I don't know some punishments. When I was making 175, I was very diligent the way I'd done it. And I, and I would literally write all stuff down, everything I ate. The, the, you know, the UFC style, isn't it? Particularly with the water loading, is you mm. crash it last minute. Mm. If I'm right, you when you were making 75, you yeah. would have a more gradual weight cut, or you'd make it a little bit. You'd be on the around the number a little bit quicker. Or would you I'd just be on, I, yeah, no, I I would be on the number quite early. I would always be my weight would be down. So when I arrived in. Montreal. I mean, we we went to we went to Montreal first, and we flew there, and then we flew to Quebec from there. But when I got to Jersey, Jersey City, where I prepared for the last month before the fight and done all my sparring, I arrived there and I was thirteen stone three. I had ten pounds to go, and that was with four weeks before the fight. Mm. Now that's unheard of, yeah. especially for someone drastically cut weight for fighter like me. Uh, and then I let my body acclimatize for a week. I stayed at 13-3 and then I remember getting to 12-12 and then I started it in really bad problems. What do, you, what do you think about that? It seems to be like a new wave technique, doesn't it? About literally taking seven, eight, nine, ten pounds. I mean, the board yeah. won't like to hear it, but it does happen. You know, it happens, of course. A, a fighter's taking that off 24 hours before the weigh-in or even on the morning of the weigh-in because the science is, is that you're dehydrated for a shorter period of time. But yeah. it's got to be knocking the bollocks out of you. What, of just 24 is. hours before the fight? And one thing we've started doing in America, which I'm going to start to try and do over here as well, is have the weigh-in at 9 o'clock in the morning. Oh, and, then okay. we have, and then we have a cere ceremonial weigh-in, a bit like yes. the UFC. The UFC, do, yeah. Again. We've been doing it in America. And I think you actually, you'll end up getting better fights. Because I yeah. think that those fighters have got an extra three or four hours to get hydrated and I think it can make a big difference to their performance and also mm. to their health as well. You know, fighters you know, you're training at one, two o'clock, you're up mm. at, if fighters are making weight, they're up at five or six in the morning, aren't they? Starting. Yeah. 
So if you can actually get that done by nine o'clock and then weigh in, go back to sleep and then come back later on, just gives you that little... My on, only worry would be with that is, is then you're going to get fighters cutting even more to make an unrealistic weight thing and I've got more time to gain. And then you'll also get fighters like the late Grazer Cholo Gatti did many years ago against Joey, uh, I think it was Gamash, gained 21 pounds overnight. So some fighters will be able to do that. Uh, some fighters won't. It's just whether how much other fighters gain and they've got an unfair advantage. Ed. So uh, it's you always going to happen. Do you think that advantage is just is that just a given in terms of the size? Because I've seen fighters come in, put so much weight on overnight, and actually look a little bit lethargic. Maybe don't you know? Is it is it a given advantage? You look at Frotch used to come in at sixty eight yeah. on, on the scales. He'd probably come in the ring at one seventy one. 172 yeah. max. Well, look at you. The best example that I've got most recently is Jamie McDonald in the Kameda fight. Yeah. Uh, and, me, and he came in and he he was one. He had to really have a drastic cut. He couldn't move. Dave rocked him in the dressing room, taking him on the pads. That's how gone he was. Sorry, not Kameda against the new way. The new way, yeah. A new way. That's where he had the drastic problems with the weight. That was when he was completely done. Uh, when we got um, in the ring, uh, when we got in the ring that night, I flew in to yeah. Tokyo, and I landed five minutes before. Well, no, I got to the hotel five minutes before the weigh-in, and I went up for the weigh-in. And Jamie was just getting on the scale, so I ran out there, and then he went into the side room, and everyone was looking at me, sort of saying, "Like he made it." But I heard when he when he made the weight, everyone cheered like he'd won the fight, you know. Yeah. So it was like it's obviously like been a bit of a mission. And when we got in the ring that night. And actually, I always remember that fight because when you talk to a fighter after the weigh-in and they know what that's just taken out of them, there's a look in their eye to say, I'm done. tomorrow's going to be tough. Do you know what I mean? Mm. And then you, you see him the next morning and you hope when you see him walking around the hotel, you know, their face is back. For the his back. And he was just sheepish. You know, he was mm. just sheepish and he knew what he had taken out of him. Mm. And that night when we got in the ring, because he's tiny, new, tiny. And we got in the ring tone, and Jamie was like, and he was, he looked massive. And I looked at the two of them, and as they were doing the intros, I went up to Jamie, I went, look at him, he's a midget. <laughs> oh. Anyway, he's like, yeah, yeah. Anyway, the bell went, came out, and I knew I was just like, Bang, hey, mate, he's a beast. He's a beast. It's, it's, um, you, sometimes you just can't get it back. And the only one that comes to mind where I ever seen him defy it, was the boy who fought Ricky Benz. I think it was Figueroa was his name in Texas. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I have never in all my whole entire life career, this boy had, I am not fucking joking, mate. He got, he was sitting on the chair next to the scales. He got carried to the chair. He got lifted. He was about to fall over and collapse. He got lifted onto the scales. He didn't even put his arms up. He failed to make weight. He made miss weight by about one or two, two pounds. Yeah, two pounds. And he walked off the scales, and I just said to Ricky Burns, you're going to hit him in the body tomorrow. I said, and he will collapse. I swear that I have seen fighters bad, not as bad as him, and they fell over when they've gone into the ring because they can't put it back in. This fucker got in the ring the next day, mate, and he was like the Energizer Bunny. And he was, I've never seen anything. Now, I know that I've heard about the things that go on, IV drips going into bodies yeah. and stuff like that. Well, that is the only answer I have for that. Mm. It's an absolute... I have never seen nothing like him in my life. He is some kind of... He's an alien. Oh, that fucker's bang out of cheating me because mm. Ed, he couldn't he, he couldn't stand on the scales himself. He got he got lifted onto the scale and still failed weight. I think he was documented as losing £25. Mm. £25 from, from the night before And he's the not even in any kind of shape, really. No. It was just oh, it was crazy, mate. I just remember thinking Ricky Burns is going to absolutely smoke him. Mm. He is absolutely out And he came out the next day, and I wouldn't mind. He just set the pace right from the off. Yeah, he yeah. just was relentless. But he's the only one I've seen defy the odds, mate. And he, and he fucking came through as well. Unbelievable. Our first guest, another scouser. We're in undated with him tonight. I've enjoyed watching this, man. Never met him before, never spoke to him apart from a couple of tweets. I want to bring in Darren Till. Oh, sorry, mate. We're keeping you up. <laughs> How are you, Darren? What's up, one of me? Oh, hi, yeah. How are you? How are you? <laughs> Late night watching Go the play. fights. What? Late night watching the fights. Yeah, me, so fuck me. I'm in bed with me. All the kids are downstairs. <laughs> <laughs> What's happening to you? You okay, mate? I'm all right, lad. How have you been, mate? I'm good, mate. Yeah, I'm good. 
I'm good. Missing, missing getting back in the cage, lad. I'm a bit of itching. Yeah, I am. I'm itching, mate. I'm proper. Fucking hell, mate. If I'm itching, imagine how you must be, mate. Retirement. He's still talking <laughs> about, about fights about there, and he don't stop phoning me up asking about fights. How much for this one? How much for this one? <laughs> Fucking hell, mate. Darren, we just, we just, I want to go straight into weight cut, Darren, because we're just talking about Tony. I've spent a lot of time following Tony around the world, and his weight cuts were brutal as well. But you two, you've got a lot in common in that respect. Yeah. Those, those days over for you in terms of those, those lower weights, it was, I see one of the documentaries I saw about you making weight. I mean, look, I see it every, every show, you know what I mean? But it was, it was brutal. Yeah. Uh, do you know what, Ed? I was, I was fucking, I was hating myself, not, physically but mentally when you know when I was doing it like it got to the point where I'd come back in 2017 from Brazil and I was making welterweight with a struggle but I was still okay and then when I beat Cowboy Cerrone I made that weight perfectly I had a few months off and in that time I started lifting weights and my frame just grew a bit bigger and obviously everyone's seen the fucking video for the Wonderboy fight and then after that, it just it was just even more of a struggle. Like, so then I beat Wonderboy, and then I went on to fight for the world title. And even though for me it, it was about fight, it should have been about fight camp and beating the guy in front of me. All I was thinking about was I just can't fucking make to wait to make weight, and it just got like that. So then I thought Woodley lost, and then that last fight with a uh, sorry, the second to last fight against Masvidal, I just. It was just, it was no more, mate. I remember in the morning when I'd made the weight, I was walking to the Asda because I had like 0.2 to go and I knew a 15-minute walk I could make it. And my coach, Colin, started running after me when I was going to the Asda around the corner in London. And he, he had to like carry me back to the hotel because I was blind. I couldn't see. Like, this is God's honest truth. I was blind. And you can't recover from that 24 days later. 24 hours later so you know obviously I, I never come out I always say you know the better man won and whatever but that kind of been good for me and that fight all that water loss on the brain and enough was enough mate um, we, we, we're a bit different with our governing body in that we've got to try and uh, although I'm sure they know about the truth about the the uh, weight making what sort of weight would you have to take off on 24 hours before that weighing so Another match about if I say it, do you use, do you use pounds or yeah, kilos? pounds, pounds. So I think the night before, I think I still had about 18, 19 pounds, something like that. Told you, didn't I? I told him this before. Yeah, I was already though, com like all completely depleted at that point. Like I'll never forget, Colin always makes me do a fifty-five minute run with the sweet set on and all, blah, 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 blah. And I usually lose about three to four kilos with that. So we're saying, you know, what, eight pound, nine pounds, something like that. And I've done it. And I still had so much to go. But at that point, I was already so depleted. Mm. I could feel me, me vision going already at the start of the weight cut. And then I just, there was no way I was missing weight in London. The first time I went in London and, you know, I made it. But I affected myself, and I do believe, truthfully, that it affected my performance. You know what I mean? Of course, that's you don't make the minute you've made that weight, you've physically done. It's just, and the and the mad thing is, when you make the weight, mentally you've got such a relief. You think you lie to yourself, and you say, "Oh, I'm I'm sound now, I'm all right." But you just you're not. You're completely fucked, and no one gets it. But as I say, the mental side of you goes, "I've made weight." It, everything's great it's going to be great now I'm just going to fight tomorrow my body will be fine and then you start walking to the fucking ring and you got going hey yeah, my legs are a bit fucking bandy or I'm in the warm up I'm behind the shots just aren't coming off nice and crisp or whatever you just it's, I can't explain it well, but that's Steven unless, unless you've done it as well obviously T unless yeah. you've done it you know you just don't know like I could sit here and explain to me beard and whoever mm. you just don't know like when a fight's over as well and you you're gorging, and they're like, why are you gorging? And you just feel like saying, because you fucking don't know what food is actually like. Yeah. Oh, do you know what I mean? <laughs> it's fucking brutal. It really is brutal. It's Thought a proper brutal business. Darren, I want to talk, talk about you growing up in Liverpool. I was talking to Tony about it before. 
and the guy sent me some stuff on you about your move out of Liverpool and the fact that you went and lived in Brazil for three years. Talk to me about that decision. And also, also tell, tell me what Brazil was like for a young man for three years. <laughs> Sure, it wasn't all that bad. I fucking got a door closed. <laughs> Do you know what, Eddie? I was just, a, I still am, mate, to be honest. I was just a scally. You know, I'm, obviously I'm a fucking, I'm an older scally nowadays, but I was just like young. I didn't have, I didn't have any fa- like family really. I was here, there, living here. I've got family, but I'm saying like no one really was directing me. And I was just, I, I was out nearly every weekend, Eddie. I was out every day. I was, I was fighting constantly on the streets. I was fighting with other fans, fighting here, there, everywhere. And, you know, to cut a long story short, I was just out one night fighting with this other fame and, and, and you know, one, one of the lads stabbed me twice in the back. I, I actually, I've seen the CCTV footage, to, no one knows this, but I actually had the CCTV footage and I, you know, just to, to see it and whatever and, and I, I've never seen it again, but I got stabbed. I was in the Aussie for like, I was in the hospital for like a week and then I, and I went the first time I came out of Aussie, I was on the crutches and I could have went and seen my mum, I could have went and seen my dad, but I went to the gym to see Colin and uh, my coach and all the lads were in there, Mark Scanlon, and I, I remember you were saying that, it was about 11 o'clock, and Colin just looked at me and he was just like, you can you can be everything, you, you, you know, you, you can be a world champion, then you can be my first world champion in the UFC, you can do it, but you're not going to do it here, son. And I, I just said to him, I, I remember saying to him, I said, Colin, do you know what, whatever you want me to do, I, I'll go and do it. He went, Go and get yourself a, fl- a flight to Brazil as soon as possible. And I was like, Brazil? He said, yeah, there's someone waiting over there for you. Go, and I guarantee you're going to come back. You'll be in the UFC, and I will get you to that world title. If, if that's what you want, then. If you want to just be a fucking nobody and a scally on the street, go and do it, mate. No problem. You can be one of them. I could have been this, I could have been that. I said, Sam, Colin. I said, I'll go next week. And I got there. I remember I was fighting the day before I got there, actually. I'd, I've never said this to no one, but I was fighting with that same fame the day before I left for Brazil. And, uh, and I remember turning up in Brazil, I had, like, scars on my face. I had a black eye, and I was just there, like, OK, let's learn. Let's, let's see what this is all about. I'd love, to, I'd love to have been a fly on the wall following you around Brazil, mate. Especially <laughs> when you first turned up. How long did it take you that to learn Portuguese? So when I got there... Uh, Tony, I was in a, an apartment with uh, one of the coaches. He, he had mates, so I was in this. I swear to God, Tony, right? 45 degrees, mate, like the, the worst heat of your life. And I was in this small room, and I'm in this tiny little room just with a little bathroom and a little flan, a little fan that like used to just click and make noises through the night. And then every day I used to go to the supermarket for eggs and that, and the birds used to just look at me like I've got free heads. Like, who the fuck <laughs> eggs? And mate, it used to piss me off so much. I used to think, right, is this how we're getting to it? Yeah, okay, I'm going to speak your language. And I had the computer, a little uh, Norby computer at the time, and I used to go home every single night and write five words specifically down that I'd need for the next day. And then six months, mate, I was speaking fluently, like completely fluently, writing slang a lot, so... It made yeah. it just goes to show you. No wonder you were fucking wasn't struggling to make way when you were living in Brazil, living in a sweat box like that. <laughs> <laughs> and then you come I'm off. flying with the weight there. Don't you <laughs> worry about yeah. back there for the next camp. Yeah, it means an all needs to have next story. camp over there. Darren, one thing oh. you're very vocal about, and, and you as well, Tony, is about is about knife crime in Liverpool. I always see you guys tweeting about it and stuff like that. I mean, I spoke to quite a few fighters about it in London as well. Darren, you've been there. You've been wrapped around it. What 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 is the problem? And what is the answer? I mean, is there an answer? I was speaking to the, you know, Jimmy Manawar from London, Eddie, yeah. yeah. And uh, he, he, he's the one who reached out to me and he said, Darren, you know, let's, let's, he, 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 what he said to me, and I fully agree with him, he, he reckons it's kids who are just completely and utterly bored, most of them. And he said, 50% of them kids, let's have it right, some of them are just plain, plain and simple, violent. Kids, young kids, they've got a destiny ahead of them, they're going to have that. But 50% of them are just bored or just whatever. And if we could get some type of funding and government, massive government backing to just get them into the gyms, it doesn't matter if they're trained by me or Tony or whoever, just get them focused on something. Because everyone will agree after the training session, you feel like like your problems have all disappeared when you're in the gym. 
And uh, that's probably why you've so, got so much pent-up anger, Tony, isn't it? Because, you, you know, you just I fucking... love it, mate. Yeah, I mate. miss it so much. It's these kids, mate, these... If they had that kind of release and that, you know, they'd seen all the older ones. Imagine they were in the gym with, like, Tony's and Jimmy Manos and Mays. You know, they'd, they'd follow suit. And I think that's what they need, just to be in the gym with some government kind of... You know, community centres. That was actually That's talking the thing about I was just about to say. That they're the things when I was growing up, we had them every year. We used to yeah. have the Art Hill, the Rodney, the Rec. The, oh, there was so many different, you know, the Lodge Lay, the one on Lodge Lay. There was just so many different youth centres. Now they're all gone. Yeah. They're, they're you just, don't see one anywhere, do you? No. The, the, I think the Art Hill is the only one that I know that's still going for the kids, but it's. We, my life was spent in community centres growing up as a kid. I'd, I'd spend all my time, literally, you'd come home from school, you'd have a little knock around the seat to the footy, and then you would go off to the youth centre, or I was going, a bit later on, I was going to the boxing gym. I started the kickboxing gym first, going up to Lodge Lane and Alfie's place. And and that's how it was, you know. You, but, but nowadays, the kids come home from school, and let me just get something straight, half of them aren't even going to fucking school. They're all smoking that green shite, that crap. Coming on, going on a PlayStation, playing on Grand Theft Auto. And what the thing is, me, my friend who's a barrister, he said, Tony, all these kids that I'm representing, he said, you sit down with them, right? And the police have got them. And then they say to them, you get, they first get in the room and they all say, no comment, pig, no this, no that, no this, no that. And it's all a big tough guy approach. And then it's only when the, 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 the policeman comes back in and says to them, listen, I've got your ear at this point. Telephone mass says you're there. You've done this, you've done that, you've done this. And then when the bank's are right, he break down in tears, and, and the, the barrister said to me, he said, it's like the, they're waiting to push reset on the console, like it's Grand Theft Auto, and they can start again. So they don't realise the damage they've done, they've ruined families, they've ruined lives. And, but these kids are smoking that shite and, and are obsessed. I'm, I don't want to blame it on games and PlayStation, stuff like that, because obviously it goes further than that, but it, they've got nothing to look forward to. They've got absolutely nothing. They come no, out of school. No role models. And just like, I, I feel like they've got like, they don't see a way. I mean, you got you know you, those games, those films. They're all dramatizing other ways to make money. But I think these kids they don't really see a vision, and they don't really see a way out. Who are the role models, though? I mean, uh, to take us out of it, out of the context. Of athletes and football's always been role models for us. I mean, for me as a kid, growing up, was always athletes. You know what I mean? Your idolised Mike Tyson, your idolised Nigel Ben, your idolised just all them guys. So for the couldn't kids now growing up. Darren is a, is a face of our area, so from Waverley, you know, I've been a boxer from there as well. The likes of Ross Barkley, Teddy Etham, all these lads have gone through the cycle and you've become a role model for them at some point. But, you know, they need more than just that. They need somewhere where they can go. We'll move on, Darren. I want to talk about the UFC card last night. My, my interest... Oh, you, you, you two, you're the UFC expert. Tony's a UFC fan. I know nothing, mate. I've seen you fight a couple of times. That's about it. But... I want, like, as a promoter, I want to ask you firstly, as a competitor, yeah. what did you think about the closed, behind closed doors as a, as a TV product, and how do you feel about it as a fighter? Do you know what, Eddie? Like, uh, you'll always get the truth from me, mate. Always get the utmost truth. And I wouldn't mind fighting. I've got my fight scheduled for August 15th in Dublin, and even though that's always been about the fans because of how the Irish uh, lot are. I, I haven't really got a comment whether it's good or bad. Like, I'm just happy there was... If, if I speak for me, I was just happy that there was something on to, to do and to watch. If it weren't, but I watch, I watch any of it and it was on. So I was just happy as a fan. I was just sitting there last night as a fan watching some fucking fights. And, you know, on the other aspect, I'm, I'm in there. So, you know, he said to me, they had a message me, whatever, I was chatting. Oh, Darren, you know, your fight's on in Dublin against Whitaker, but there's going to be no fans. You know what, mate? I would, people, everyone, I get that question 10 times a day. I'd be truly fucking gutted, but I'd still go through with it. So do, you that's just... would, do you think it would affect your performance? Do you know what, mate? I don't know. I truly don't know. I could sit here and say something, but I don't know because I've never, I've never experienced that. I don't no, think you I any. Say that a ring's a ring, and you know that. But that's what I'll say. What I'll say about that is, every it, no, you don't know what you are going to react until you put in the situation. But let me tell you, mate, when some fella walks at you and he's going to take your fucking head off, mate, you'll soon react quick enough <laughs> to believe you, mate. A fight will soon be a fight once he throws a punch or a kick. It's 
it, I can't explain the feeling you get when you're just about to lock horns and fight. It's just, it's like you could be anywhere. It, it, it like outside of the cage ring where it doesn't matter. It's just what's in front of you. I used to have a sole focus on, I've got to break you down as fast and as viciously as I possibly can. And the only times I remember the crowd taking a part in fights where I've done is where I'm not going to lie when I've been knocked down. Like Goodison Park one, I swear to God, mate, when that macabre hit me and snapped my nose and I was flat on my back, I literally remember hearing the noise of, <clears throat> I heard that noise. And, and that's mad that I can remember that, but I definitely remember that noise. So it's very few and far between when, when crowds do play a part. And, and I know that fans are not want, going to want to hear that, but it's true, mate. When a bell goes and another fellow's going to smash your face in, the last thing you're thinking about, mate, is the crowd. That's me personally. How Darren feels, I don't know, but I'm pretty sure if someone's going to punch that in the face, mate, it's not going to matter if there's anyone in that stadium or not. He's going to react quick. You know what I was thinking of people like, for example, Connor, you know, McGregor? He feeds off a lot of the fans. Yeah. That's his energy, energy. is it? How would he? How would he fare up to it? You know what I mean. Mm. So, mm. I'll tell you what, walks and things like that involve the crowd. So I get your point with him, but once again, mm. I think that's the part of his whole the bravado thing, the entourage, the the the, the swagger, the way he looks, the way he moves. Everything plays into the crowd. Even mate, when he's walking around the cage and the arms are going and stuff mm. like that. But he's so it wouldn't really look the same with no crowd, would it? <laughs> no, but but oh, make no mistake, mate, like, when the bell the goes, yeah. <laughs> make no mistake, he's still laser like focused when the bell goes. Yeah. I mean, when he was in the biggest fight of his career, when he beat Jose Aldo, mate, against all the odds, because he was completely rose off as just a mouthpiece before that fight, and mate, he went in there and he had everything around him was going insane. It was full of Irish, the whole venue, mate. It was just mm -hmm. everything was going nuts. Mm -hmm. And he still had the laser like focus to wait for the shot to come at him, get lean back and then lean over and crack him. And mate, to, to have that focus in such a crazy environment shows you that he can have it. He doesn't need anything. He's just he's got that focus and he can he can use it, mate. So I would assume someone you don't get to be the levels that the likes of Darren and the boys in the UFC have got to without having that focus and that vision of being able to switch it on and off, I'm sure. Be a work held. I mean, last night, if any, if last night was to go by any way, shape, or form, it was fucking unbelievable. The fight. If last just... night was anything to go by, mate, Franny oh, and Gan, who's a fucking animal. <laughs> mate, I would like to I mean? into him into a dark oh, alley. Let me tell you, he's got some yeah. dynamite in his hands, him. I swear to God, mate. We're we we still going to do this in Ghana against Dillian White? Mate, I, I just, if. It's just frightening. If that fella hits you with them four ounce gloves on me, just just say night night on your way down. You know what I mean? Yeah. Just get a pillow because yeah. he, he's just he's just got. Joe Rogan made a good comment. He went, "This fella's turning up. You're turning up to fight in France and Ghana, and this fella's got bazookas, and you're turning up with a pistol." <laughs> <laughs> that was the compromise yeah. he made. He was unbelievable, mate. I, mean, I don't think don't he, I don't think he could hang with like top level boxers like that. What you've just mentioned, no Dillian White and that. In a boxing ring, I don't think he's got an absolute hope. But no. we, had, we had the debate last week with Bisping, and uh, actually, you know, Tom was saying off air like, in different generations, you against Bisping would have been a yeah. monstrous fight. Yeah, yeah. against Liverpool. I yeah. mean, can you imagine yeah. two yeah. characters? And yeah. we were talking about the whole boxing and you know, UFC thing, and you know, I, I think and Garner against Dillian White. Dillian White can. You know, he was a kickboxer. I'm sure he can grapple mm. a little bit, but the basic analysis from Tony and Bisping was that as soon as you one of you boys get the fire on the floor, it's game over. So obviously, yeah, but I, I don't. We're, we're, it's different because people always say to me, "What's harder to do?" And I, I started off boxing. The harder thing to do is a boxer to come to MMA because there's so many arts to learn. Mm. We, that we already box, so we could go into boxing, but. What I'm trying to say is someone like Ngannou, yeah, sound, the power, the four ounces, he just simply could not beat Dillian White on mm -hmm. Dillian White's worst day. That's just the facts of the matter. In a chance. I'm just talking, in the cage, in the ring, if it was in the cage and it was pure boxing, same thing, mate. He's, he, Dillian knows about movements and everything. Yeah, he might be a crazy brawler, but this is just my opinions. We, we have to look at 
as I'm talking now, I'll always tell the truth, facts. Franny and Garner just simply could not be the higher level. He even he's only been training a few years, do you know what I mean? So even the mid levels, even maybe the low levels, that's no disrespect to him. He just could not hang with these type of boxes. We shouldn't even be discrediting Dillian here saying that. Do you know what I mean? Now, the difference I said is, last week that your that, top that boxer, just... Eddie, you get your top boxer and I'll pull a neck off and make bam bam bam. Yeah. You just top boxer, Eddie. <laughs> come on, that, well, well, what 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 are you wearing at the minute? Fucking hell, don't ask me. Come on, you're embarrassing me. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's your ideal fight weight? So I'm on the UFC thing it says I'm six foot, but I'm I reckon I'm about six foot two, mate, and I'm about You're bigger than six foot. Yeah. I'm 16 when you stand with me and I'm far off me. 205. 215 now, 215 pounds, mate. And what, what, what would you be comfortable fighting at? I'm trying to think about matchups here for you, Darren. <clears throat> he fights at 185, Ed. All right, well, so. Go to 190, 195, maybe 190. And he's comfortable there. Mm. You're it's looking at a Coley. You're fighting a lot of blown up light heavyway, aren't you, really? I don't give well, a you fuck can get Froch. What about Froch? He'll have a go. <laughs> Frotch is, about, is about 190 pounds. <laughs> With my name now, mate, we sell out to 120,000 people in the arena. Come on. Mate, I love, I love when you went. I love when you went to the Echo Arena with the UFC. It's brilliant. It's brilliant. It's brilliant. It's funny, there's a funny story. Yeah. It's how much Tony Bellew loves you because not many people know that that was his stag weekend, and I actually spoke to was him the really? night before. I spoke to him the night before. He couldn't really talk. To be fair, he was oh, in Mallorca. Really nice and then about four hours later, I saw him at your fight. And he was like, <laughs> pretending he was fresh in his little give on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Yes, can't wait for this. But. Yes, but Tom, what was that crowd like at, at, in terms of versus, no, but versus boxing? Is it similar similar faces, similar people? Or? It, it, it's no, it's completely different. It's a totally different crowd and it's a totally different atmosphere. What I would say is, it's, I think they appreciate the fighters more. I think. The, because it, it's mad, to, I've, I've said this last week, the UFC with the production team behind it, every fighter's got a backstory. Everyone yeah. knows each other's story and every fighter's given out the correct amount of air time. It's not like you're just throwing in there and no one knows who you are. Like in boxing, yeah. sometimes it happens. In the UFC, the production is so good and Dana White does a fantastic job making sure every fighter yeah, does. Known. Yeah, he does. Yeah, your story yeah. gets out there. So I, I'll guarantee you, every UFC fan, knows about that and they know his backstory they know he lived in yeah. Brazil they know he speaks yeah. Portuguese they know the opponents he's fought like whereas in boxing you just don't get that sometimes but no it was a great atmosphere that was unbelievable when Darren came out against Wonderboy yeah, was... and you was the underdog as well that wasn't you yeah I was yeah I mean because he's like considered the you know everyone's always everyone's always expecting me to just come in and just rumble but yeah. he was like he is considered top three strikers of all time yes he's so mm. You know Colin, mate, and Colin was like, Till, we're just going to have to go in there, whether it's a ball and fight or what, let's calculate, let's make him miss hit, just outstrike him and, you know, nearly had him in the fifth when I nearly knocked him out. But it's one of them, mate, but I think uh, the walkouts in the crowd and everything about it, and because it had never been there, was something else. And you know what, mate, I've been to boxing, I was at, uh, I was at Mick Collins when he fought in uh, Manchester, and the bigger fights yet, yeah, like I've seen AJ at Wembley and that, they're, they're unbelievable, but then, Comparing the other shows, they're not comparable. To, this is just my opinion, not comparable to the UFC because every single UFC is the same as Liverpool. Every single production, it's all the same. Whereas boxing world for the bigger names get more, it'll get more the attention, won't it? Whereas if it was just a small UFC, let's say, I don't know, in there, uh, you know, wherever, fucking Wallacey over the road, it'd be the same production, same everything. So that's where I think the UFC does is a little bit better, in my opinion. Your thoughts, both of you, on the fights last night? Review them. That's a chat for you, Tony and uh, Darren. Just boss, what mate. about the main event? Oh, I haven't seen it, but apparently the main event was unbelievable. Yeah, just fucking... I feel sorry, to be honest with you, mate, because I was actually having this conversation with me, me bird's alpha, he's a boxing coach, and uh, I was having a conversation with him last night. I, I think boxers take more damage to the head. Because of the head yeah. trauma over, over 12 rounds, it's just pure punching the head. Whereas in MMA, you can always do different things. You can take down, you can stall. But then a main event like last night, that can't be good for the brain with four rounds gloves on like that. No. Just, I, I'm sort of thinking about their health today. Even though the fight for me, mate, as a fan, you know, I'm just sitting here as a fan, 
It was fucking incredible. It was really I incredible. Think he, I don't think he has to be the to same. There. What, mate? Did you fancy him to win? Yeah, I always go for the underdog, mate. I'm, I always, I always have my bets on Real and I always go for the underdog. But I went for Gatey, but I actually thought Ferguson was going to win. So I, I bet I, for, I, for I, Gatey. But I, thought I don't, th- I don't think strong. Ferguson will ever be the same after last night. That no. I don't I'm think he'll ever really be the same again. He took like that in UFC before. He, he took that much. Uh, he got stopped off a jab. I believe you, me, me. The culmination. I mean, it's one of the greatest chins I've ever seen. No one can yeah. ever say nothing about Tony Ferguson. Even he Beefy tweeted it Jesus. this morning. Even he was the same. Oh, like, amazing. wow, because nothing else is on. So all, everyone's obviously watched the fight, haven't he? Yeah, I've always been. I've watched it for. I, mean, I go back as far as the Mark Kerr days, the Smashing Machine days, and I was watching uh, documentaries yeah. and stuff like that. Maybe <laughs> I love it, Coleman and all them. But watching that last night was a little bit, it was sickening. I, 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 that gate, she just kept ploughing away and ploughing away and made that as a, a detrimental effect. As Dad said before, and we touched on last weekend, in UFC and mixed martial arts, there's so many disciplines you're trying to conquer. There's so many different disciplines. There's so many ways to lose. So, it's very, very rare you will see someone just get bludgeoned with the fists. Because what happens is when someone's getting punched all over the place, they'll try and take you down. Or, yeah. you know, when they, they'll, they'll fight. Everyone has their own strengths and their own mm-hmm. certain ways of moving. It's like Anderson Silva. You get freaks sometimes you have So I'd say John Jones might find the Silva. The freaks who can do everything. They can strike, they can wrestle, they can do jiu-jitsu. Mm-hmm. But then you get someone like that Gaethje last night. I didn't realise he was an accomplished wrestler, wrestler that. And he was saying he is he, he, but he, he just, use he it, just wants he? to go out there and destroy and brain people. cells in oh, his, his own and the, the opponent. As much as made fucking so entertaining, I'm thinking about his health today because he cannot be okay. And I've seen him no. at press conferences, we've been at press conferences, and I've heard them little slurs and speech. And slurs. that's I, why I, I, I always come all that about Ferguson because I, I wasn't, I, I've never fancied Ferguson against Khabib because for Khabib, someone. Ground and pound specialist meets going to drag you down. Thank you. Has he got any chance right. against Khabib or not? Yeah, yeah, hundred yeah, percent. I think yes, because his takedown okay. defense is incredible. But it's just whether he can withstand that pressure for five rounds, because mm. not a lot of people can. Now can let's talk Khabib about your off. career. What's uh, what's coming up next? What do we expect to see in Dublin or when it happens? Or what what's next for you? And what do you want to accomplish? Obviously, I'm just chasing, I'm just chasing greatness. Ed, obviously, uh, you know we're all in this for the fucking. The money and what everyone says, the fucking cliches, but I'm just chasing greatness, mate. At the end of the day, I've got in this to be one of the greatest ever, so that's what I'm chasing. And you, you're always going to have your, your setbacks, and we all are, and I'm a bad man. And I'm sure I'll have many more, many, many more, but I'm chasing greatness, mate. So I'm going to, the, to beat this, not the, the former champion now in Dublin, and then I'm going to beat the current champion in Anfield. Next that'd year, be that'd be unbelievable. But amazing, you do have, you do have, you do have downfalls, and obviously one of those will be when I take your money when AJ bashes up Tyson Fury. Do you know what I mean? Fifty quid, Ed. <laughs> yeah, fifty no quid, problem. mate. I got fifty you got quid. That. I got fifty with Billy Joe as well. Okay, okay. So, I'd say hundred. I'd say hundred. But well, until that? you give me, a, if until me give you your box set to fight, get me good pay, Jack and boxing. It'll have to be fifty, mate. Yeah. Yeah. The so worst thing is, is the, the worst thing about it is now you got it. But the worst thing is, is un, you know, AJ's the outsider. I should be even getting odds. I'm giving you unbelievable odds. You can go and lay <laughs> it off down. You you know the truth. You know AJ's going to win the fight. You'll probably lay the bet off down the bookies anyway. Ah, is, 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 he, is, he, is he the favourite? Is Tyson the favourite? Uh, Fury's Tyson's the favourite. Favorite, yeah. 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 If yeah. I put fifty grand on now with William Hill, I'd get seventy-five back for AJ. Ah, okay. Yeah. That's a, not no for Fury. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. So, including your why, stake, including your stake. Yeah, including the stake. That's why, mate. We just thought Fury's gonna punch the head off fucking AJ. Do you think Eddie, so? And you know it. You're on. You're on, know on oh, you're on. Listen, mate. You're on the wrong Zoom here with me and Bellier. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> I, I know. Yeah, I am actually. No, it, but to be fasc- honest, it's fascinating. My bed's our fellas downstairs, and he fucking. He used to fucking hold the pads for and he hates it when I slag him. But yeah. <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's a great part. Listen, it's not it's slagging him. It's, no, it's, it's giving him a yeah. opinion. I said, oh, Darren, I see Fury come to Monaco to meet me about two years ago. And I was talking about signing him, right? And he wanted a couple of these easy fights, which I, I, I thought, I didn't think the money was right for it. But it wasn't even that. I looked at him and he was 28 stone. Right, Jesus. and I just thought 
I ain't wasting my time, mate, on you. you that was that as fattest, was it? Yeah. Mate, what he's done is unbelievable because he was, I mean, he was done. Done. You know, there's putting on weight between fights and there's just going to a point where really, even if you lost it all physically, you shouldn't be the same fighter. So I have to give him massive respect what he's done. It's gone beyond boxing, though, Ed. Yeah. It's gone yeah, beyond yeah. boxing. It's gone beyond... It's just... It's, 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 it's mad it's as well, Tony, right? Because he was the enemy, wasn't he? Obviously, we, you know, we've all got backstories. and Because everyone knew he was out and he was crazy benders and whatnot, blah, blah, blah. He was mad because he was the enemy. And now it seems... Oh, he's the hero. He's, just, yeah. he's the hero, isn't he? It's, it's crazy how things happen. But that's I what think I'm he's just about. turned it round. He's turned it round and, and let people know that, listen, he's not the only one. We've all got demons, mate. I don't care who you are. and no, 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 You want to profess my life's greatness. Nah, no one's life's great, mate. And he's just highlighted and shown that even a heavyweight champion of the world, your life can be shit. You can be well, shit up. You can get down. Sorry to cut you up, Tommy, but that's something I uh, I touched on a lot. Did you just have Ariel on the show, did you? Yeah. Yeah. Helwani, yeah. Well, I was on his. I don't know if you've seen it. And, that, for me now, is like my biggest thing that I want. Everyone talks about being real and what, whatnot. But I was saying this today, I said, people, let's say people now, they're on season five, episode six of the Dad Until Show on social media, whatnot. They need to see the highs and the lows. Not everything that's positive. And no, Dad Until's got this great fucking life and it's watches and it's cars and it's great food every day. Because, mate, I've got three kids... I've got me problems. I've got so many problems. I've got so many great things happening. But I just, I'm sick of the broadcast that it's this. This is why a lot of depression, as we're talking about young kids, is coming about the suicides and that because the looking and the scrolling through Instagram and it's perfect life after perfect life. And it's not because it's all bullshit at the end of the day. I could go oh, now, get in my big car, go and take a nice photo of me. Oh, great day, peaceful. Mate, I've been sat in bed all day, fucking fucked, wanking my head off. Do you know what I mean? That's that's the real life of that until. Do you know what I'm saying? So the yeah, thing is, you're right in what you're saying. Eight. But it's a pet eight, man. Because let's just show, just show yourself. Obviously, I won't yeah. Put, um, I won't put my know? own personal life, my personal problems on there. Sometimes it'll get out, and I'll be pissed off, and I'll put something on where I'm annoyed. But. What does annoy me is is people just putting on the highlights of their life yeah. and not showing that, you know, everyone. I don't the care who you're at. I don't. Yeah, I don't care how you're at, how famous you're at, how much money you've got, what you're doing. Everyone has demons and has problems. Everyone has shitty days. So, for anyone who's watching this, don't think everyone's days. It's not me. We all have shitty days. I wake up some days yeah. and I just can't be. I just don't want to do it. And I've got four kids, mate, and it's stress, and I just don't want to. I don't want to get out of bed, but you've got to do something because you're killing kids, can't feed them fucking selves. Yeah, but, I'm not on about posting your personal problems. I mean, if you have a fail in the gym and it's fucking footage there, like I had one the other week, post it. Let people know that, yeah. Tony Bell, you, Darren Till, AJ, Tyson Fury, we all fail. Now, I, think, now I think they've got to make a film about you, mate. From from the fight in Liverpool yeah. to the, the flight to uh, Brazil. It's a great story, mate. It's a great story. Listen, I've loved having you on. We were only supposed to have you on for 20 minutes. You've been on yeah. for about 45 minutes. So thanks very much for coming on. It's the first time I spoke and to you. I've got to say, even though you've abused me on Twitter, Twitter even though you've abused me on Twitter for about a year, you're <laughs> quite a nice fella. All right, Dale, thanks for coming on, mate. I wish you all the best. Thanks. Take care, mate. Thank you. Great chat with Darren Till. Fascinating, fascinating character. Next up, the body snatcher, WBC world interim heavyweight champion, Dillian White. I think one of the luckiest men in all this isolation, just been out in Portugal, in camp. You're the only fighter that's in camp right now. How you doing, Dill? I'm good, mate. I'm sure Povetkin's in camp too. Never underestimate the Russians, mate. Trust me. Yeah, that's yeah. true. That's true. That's true. Um, I was just talking to Tony, Dillian, because just saying before he retired, he was messaging me a lot, saying he felt that you were an easy fight for him and probably he would end you inside three rounds. I don't know if you've got any comments on that, you know. But. Yeah, as you know, Dills, Eddie's the best shit there in the business. You, you know so. what? <laughs> yeah, yeah, listen. I, I, I could understand. Even if he did, I could understand why, because everyone underestimates me anyway. You know? Everyone does underestimate you, When they get you, shit in their real life. 
Yeah, they, they do. When they get in there, they realise that, you know what, this guy, there's more to him than what you think, you know what I mean? And that's what I do. They all understand me. They get in there, I jab better than they think, I have more fight in me than they think, I'm faster than they think, you know, and then they realise, oh shit, he's better than what we thought, you know? Just, just to clear that up, I was joking before you were... Uh, I know, I know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Tony is cool. We've had all ups and downs in their career, and that, but me and Tony is cool, man. There's no beef here. Actually, Dillian, one, one, I must be like, not just like, you know, trying to big him up, but when you had that issue that, you know, with you, Cad, at the end of the uh, uh, last year, yeah. Tony was one of the people that, that did back oh, you. That pissed you know, me off. Especially off, you know, off camera yeah. to us and, you know, believe you. And, right and, and AJ as well, to be fair. Uh, and me, me and Tony, me and Tony speak. We actually got, we actually had each other's numbers for a long time. Now we speak and we start kissing. You know, we we've always kept it real with each other. You know? When I fought and I done well, he always congratulate me and vice versa. You know what I mean? Obviously, he's um he's someone to look up to the, the way his career went, the losses oh, he had, the way his career his career was going in nowhere, and then he come and knocks out my car, but and then everyone's like, oh, okay, you know what I mean? Because when he got stopped by Dennis Stevenson, you're thinking, oh, yeah, this guy, he's all mouth, isn't he? Just a, a, a tough guy from Liverpool who gives it the oh, big, man, and then he come back and he come back and done his thing. So credit where credit's due, man. Thank you. I think good, good promotion, generally. Um, <laughs> <laughs> one, thing, one thing that you do have in common is, that, and Tony's definitely not coming back, but he was talking about the Andy Ruiz fight. Yes, I've got... I really keep thinking about you and Andy Ruiz, did I know you two are going backwards and forwards, but I think he's such a good fight. Firstly, Tony, you, know, you, you have talked about Ruiz as well, but Dillian against Andy Ruiz, great, great fight. It's a brilliant fight, and it's one that Dillian wins, and wins quite handily, in my opinion. Uh, I actually think he stops Andy Ruiz. I just don't think Andy Ruiz is, is, is cut out and set for the kind of pace that Dillian can set at the first off. And then number two, he doesn't have the height, the reach, the size to be able to compete over 12 rounds. It's all well and good fighting Andy Ruiz in his fight, which is up close and in the pocket and letting him trade and get off. But Dillian has advantages going into that fight. First of all, his height and reach, they're huge advantages. Uh, and, he, you know, he's actually probably a harder one-punch hitter than Andy Ruiz. Uh, I, you know, I don't think you could see Andy Ruiz going in there and, and starching people. I, do, I think it's a culmination that's how Andy Ruiz works. So I think Dylan would beat Andy Ruiz. And I think Andy Ruiz knows that. I've seen, you know, even though I'm pissing around and joking around saying on social media, I, I would play with Andy Ruiz. I said, part of me, yes, does believe I, I could do it. But it, it's, it's amazing to see how quick Andy Ruiz came back and responded and said, let's do it straight away. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm willing to fight you. You know what I'm saying? It's not so, the easy payday tone. That was a problem. <laughs> Yeah, Jesus. So it was, it was amazing to see how quick Andy Ruiz responded. But yeah, Dillian called anyone and everyone. And it's like they just go quiet and silent and then start dragging up false emails and stuff. So I really do feel for him because as a light heavyweight, I was very similar like Dillian. I challenged everybody. I was vocal on everybody. I just wanted to be shot in the title. Don't get me wrong. I got it and I failed. But, you know, it didn't help that I was having to use like nearly £45 to get down to light heavyweight. But... Dillian has been very open, very honest. And I think the thing with Dillian is he's, he's come from a place where the public have thought he's just a mouth and he's just this and that. And then he has the loss to AJ. But then, like me, you've rebounded and you've got yourself to a place now where the public is on your side. They love you. They, have, they can appreciate how hard you've worked to get there. Dillian, you've fought anyone and everyone. You've fought people who, in my opinion, you shouldn't have fought. I, I think that's a, that's a risk too far. I would have said that, I that, that's, what when, that's what happened when Eddie ends up promoting, he gives you two weeks notice <laughs> and he goes, Oh, and he goes, Oh, you're a pro, just be ready anytime the phone rings. So, yeah, it's what I it think is. the Josie Parker fight was one that was really risky. I mean, to be fair, I couldn't believe that you took that fight, but I couldn't believe he took that fight either, uh, Dillian, to be honest with you. Like, how often coming off the back, I mean, he must have just felt that you were, you know, a, a straightforward fight because you come off the back of losing for the Unified Heavyweight World Championship. You, I've got to give him props as well. You know, to jump in and fight you no. straight off the bat it, after, after AJ it, was... It, it, you know what? If I was in his position, I would have taken the fight with Major because he's looking at me thinking, OK, I just went the distance with Joshua. I didn't really get hurt. Um, Joshua meant to be this big machine and he's beaten Dillian and stopped him. So why not? You know, he looks at me thinking, oh, well, he's not all that. 
you know, um, he's not as big as Joshua. He's not as good as Joshua. That's what he, he would have been thinking. So, thinking he took the fight against me. But what he didn't understand is that I'm a dog. I know how to fight. I'm like, I'm, I'm, like, I'm like a purebred fighting line pit bull. I can fight. You know, obviously, I'm learning to box. I'm getting better. I'm getting better shape. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. But for me, firstly, I'm like a proper line bred fighting dog. I can fight. And it, that's, that's the only thing he, he overlooked, the fact that I can fight. And the fact that I'm not scared to get dirty in, in the trenches and mix it. You know what I mean? And when he felt the steel hand and he lied down, he thought, hmm, hang on a minute. What's going on here? You know? This is the thing, though, Dillian. What they don't do is the these guys from the outside look at results. They look at the box. I can see you fought him, how you got on against him. What people have to look further into is yes. how does this guy's characteristics match up with yours? How does this guy's attributes match up with yours? And that's what they don't do in these days. They don't study a fight and say, well, he's good at this, he's good at that. He can do this, he can do that. And that's what Joseph Parker, I believe, done with you. I think he just looked at the literal, literally the box rack and thought, ah, oh, well, or he watched it against AJ and thought, this is what it is. Not took into consideration how much you've improved, how much you've gone away. You changed your whole game and camp for the AJ fight and whatever you have you and what you've done. So he didn't take that into consideration and he paid massively for it. And as I say, it, it, it's only grown. Your flow now is going up and up. Your stock is rising with each and every fight. And, you know, with this Pavekin one next, I do, I do actually think you're going to do Pavekin. I'm not going to lie. I'd say within eight rounds. And I don't want to blow smoke or let you think that this is going to be, it's not going to be an easy night, but I just don't no, think no. Alexander Pavekin is going to understand until you start mixing it with him on the inside, just how, no. for me, Alexander Pavekin is a small, dangerous heavyweight, but ain't no small heavyweight can mess with the real big boys. I'm telling you now, and he is, he's in deep trouble. You, mate. I really do think that. You, you know, it's funny, at the way, and what's funny is, he sort of had a good feel. He felt my belly, he felt my arms and stuff. It was weird. He was feeling me up like, oh, this guy must be still fat from, from Saudi. And he was, I, and that's the thing. People understand me. Listen, I came into a fight in Saudi out of shape. My mind was all over the place. I got the all clear a day before the fight or something, but I was still so angry. You know, I was just in a bad place. So that's what these guys to get. They look at me in one fight. They don't know what's going on in my career or in my life, what's going on. But the next time I come in completely different, then they're like, oh, okay. He's one. He's one forty-five or one forty-eight. He's not. He's not two two hundred and seventy-three pounds. Okay. And then, listen. My style changes every fight and every camp. You know, if you watch my last three fights in a row, they've all been different, style, different body shapes. You know, so I just let them say what they want, do what they want to do. Whoever won it can get it. Simple as that. You're out in Portugal. It's a great place to train. I've been there myself. Browns is a fantastic place. Uh, closed doors and you know the the. The machines, everything there is perfect. So you're in the right place. All it's down to now is the man. Tony, yeah. is that where we went? Is that where we? Is that where you went for the Usyk camp? Yes. That's <laughs> where, well, what I've done is I got married you in remember? July. Yeah. Yeah. I got but married in July, and then I, I, I was on my honeymoon, and uh, my plan was to come back after the honeymoon and then take the kids away because me and my missus just went away on our own after getting married. So we said we'll go to Portugal. And we, we hired a villa in that big estate where Browns is, Dill. And yeah. uh, I phoned, me, I let me miss it. I just said, listen, I'm flying Dave Caldwell over here. I said, I'm going to start training camp. And I literally told her the day when we got there. <laughs> I mean, and I was like, but do you remember you were like, Browns. we, we yeah. checked your weight and you said, Look, like, the only way really that I can take this fight is if I start yeah. tomorrow. I was on holiday there, Dillian. Yeah. And I just and told her yeah, I was start yeah, training that, camp. That, 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 that's the thing though, when you're, when you're a fighter, you got to be ready and, and your, your wife and family, they got to understand that, listen, when the, when the phone goes, we might be on our only moon or it might be on holiday, if the phone goes and this is an opportunity, I need to get ready now. I, and that's the same problem with my family. Like, mm. when I was coming here, I heard that lockdown was going to happen Sunday and I, I, um, my, I packed up all of my things Saturday. I throw the dogs in a car and drive straight from 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 London straight to Portugal. It's crazy driving, you know. What I mean, I was I was driving like, like I drove straight, non like forty hours straight. Like I couldn't. Wow. No, 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 you wouldn't believe you two. You two old school. You wouldn't believe now. Conversation with fighters where it's like, right, you're gonna fight here, then you're gonna fight here. It's like, oh yeah, but I was gonna go away after that fight, and I've got this thing planned, and you know, wow. it's, it is. It is frustrating. I think this lockdown will change that because literally now it's going to be like, right, 
you've got a slot then. Do you want it or not? Oh, no, no. Okay, no problem. We'll see you next year. You know, the good thing is, yes, like Tony, tell you, we've had losses in our career. I've had mines early in my career. He's had one in probably the middle of his career, whatever. Those losses sometimes change you for the, the better. It's like, my loss was like, okay, now I've seen what's what. Now I need to level up. I need to go again. I need to take my opportunities. And once you lose once, you're not, you're not, you're not worried about losing. You're not scared about losing. You just, you, you, just know, you just know, listen, all I need is the right amount of time and the right opportunity, and I'm ready. I don't care about, how oh, I need to look perfect for this, I need to look perfect for that. All I care about is getting the win. That's it. Well, the good, news for, fight sports, the good news for fight sports, Dillian, was that the UFC returned at the weekend. Obviously, it was in America, but you know they're off, to, off and running. And we had, last week, we had uh, Bisping on and Ariel Hawana. You, your name comes up a lot with these guys, you know, because I was talking about the Nganu fight and stuff like that. Did, First of all, did you watch the UFC and how did you think it looked and felt behind closed doors? Because ultimately, that's where your fight with Povetkin is heading. I think it's definitely a difference. There's a massive difference, obviously, without the crowd. You could see when Gunn was walking out, he was trying to like <laughs> look around a bit. He, was, he got to the cage and he was like acting a bit or whatever. But, you know, um, as for the fight, I thought that they picked a perfect fight for him. The guy that seems dangerous, but that guy... That guy was scared of his wits, you know what I mean? And me personally, if Ungarno came at me and fight me like that, I would have knocked him out. Just, just, just let him run into the jab because he's just swinging. Just keep your hands up, let him run into the jab and just, just keep picking him apart, you know what I mean? But the boxing behind closed door, it's, um, it's a funny one, man. I think, but the good thing is, like I said, I'm a fighter anyway. I'm willing to fight anyway. I, I, I'm willing to still have a brawl anyway or anyway. I've calmed down a lot in that way, but... It's not a problem for me. We've been in gyms. We've, we've been in many camps far, and we've had harder fights in the gym than we've actually... I've had harder fights in the gym than I've had in, in, in the ring with just me, my coach, and their coach. So it'd be similar, I think. I've always and, said this for a while, and the behind closed doors, then when you watch the UFC on Saturday, the UFC 249, I think one thing that stood out to me more than anything was you could literally hear the guys when they were breathing. And, yes. uh, and you could hear how they were blowing like and tired. Like so it, it will give you so much more, drama. I don't know, in, in drama, incentive. I mean, a fighter, if you could, when we're fighting, you know, you, we can't even hear each other breathing. We can. We don't really pay attention to the crowd much. But when another man throws a punch, it's just on your, your laser mind. You're focused on this other fighter. Yeah. But I'm telling you now, these could hear each other breathing. So when a body shot landed, and then things you get away with a little, <laughs> hear this, me, you were hearing everything. And, and Ganu's matchup was 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 a given, really, because that guy just—I mean, the wind yeah. off one of the punches went across his face and his eyes like <laughs> up like this. <laughs> it was like it's about to go. And, uh, it, it was, uh, <laughs> and, and so he only clipped him with a left hook, and when the left hook came out, listen, and Ganu's powerful, but then as that until touched on yesterday. You can't live with a boxer. If Dillian can go in a cage, and if he tries to stand up and come at you like in one swing, a jab or any kind of decent one, two, he's out like a light. Uh, uh, quick, uh, uh, just a quick story, Dillian. Czech Congo was a, was a heavyweight who was very similar to Ngani. Yeah, he's he a mate of, mine, mate of mine. Mate of mine. Do you remember when he first when Czech Congo first came on the scene? Everyone was hyping him and saying he's the knockout king. He's he's, he's so powerful. He's so dingo. Czech Congo asked him the hardest he'd ever been hit. Do you know what he said? He said it was off Tony Quigley a super middleweight and Tony wasn't even labelled as a puncher and he mm. said Tony quickly hit him in a sparring session and he's never been hit as hard in his whole life so that that, that tries to that's a heavyweight UFC contender that against a, a British but also, standard do you, think the way, do you think it's the way these fighters are they able to take shots like everyone's talking about and Garnu how heavy his hands are but are, well, are they gloves on mate everyone's have got heavy hands Yeah, yeah, Have you put them me. gloves on, Dillian? Yeah, yeah, I've, I've had them in many fights. I've had them in many mm. fights. You know, there's one of them on the internet, like with my, my debut, it lasted only 20 seconds or whatever. But um, but I know what they'll do. Their game plan will be to kick the legs and to, 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 to take me down. That's what their game plan will, that's what their game plan will be. He would never try and stand up with me. He's not stupid. He would never try and do that. And the thing is, I, I come from a martial arts background anyway, so I can wrestle. I, and I can I, I can do tie boxing, so obviously I have to go back to it for a bit. But mm. listen, 
it's a fight anyway. I don't care. I'll have it out. If he wants to I want you to be world heavyweight champion, but you against <laughs> Ngannou is fucking huge. I'm yeah, telling yeah. you now, I think he's flat on Ngannou. I don't care. I, he can't wrestle Dillian. He, he has not got a wrestling bone in his body. Mm. So he literally walks in and he swings. But there's no even decent technique on the punches. I mean, there is some. If you, did you watch Gaethje against Ferguson? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Gaethje's punch, Gaethje punches, man. He put them together nice. Some of the right hands yeah, and yeah, left yeah. hooks. You can see he knows what he's doing. But this Ngannou, it fucking swings. I'm, I'm talking like... He just thinking, if I land, they're going to go to yeah. sleep. But, we, but it's the thing, if you fight someone like me, it would be a lot more cautious and a lot more careful. You know what I mean? It wouldn't, you, you, it, there's some guys you know that, listen, I'm going to blow this guy away. You just know I'm going to blow this guy away. Then there's other guys that you're thinking, okay, all right. I am going to blow this guy away, but I need to be a bit more careful. You know, you think, all right, this guy's dangerous. I'm going to just outbox him. You know what I mean? I'll outfight. But then there's other guys just think, you know what? You know what? I'm just going to go out there and blow this guy away. Dylan, Eddie's talking to Dana, so Eddie can do it, you know. You just you just tell him the number that you've got in mind, and he can do it. I'm telling you, oh, he can man. do it. Huge, huge, huge. <laughs> That's it. That's it. We got, listen, we got Povetkin first, then we want... Yeah. Andy Ruiz, and you got to fight for the WBC world title. So no, 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 no. For, forget Andy Ruiz. I want Joshua Tyson Fury after Povetkin. Forget oh. Andy Ruiz. Andy Ruiz got a big fight with diabetes at the minute. <laughs> and not, not type one, type two, type two. The, 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 the bad one. Well, listen, Dio. I know you're training out there in Portugal. I really appreciate you coming on, mate. Uh, um, training hard for Povetkin. <laughs> you know the plans going on for us. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, I think we'll have, hopefully have some kind of announcement or news this week on the date for Povetkin, but you know with the, the plans ongoing and uh... you know what on that note yeah, what a fight it is though me and Povetkin being closed door two warriors mm. that's going to come to have it you know we're, he's not going to come to mess about you know what I mean Povetkin's mm. going to come to fight you know what I mean the guy there's something about Povetkin that's very similar in, in me as well the way we fight and the mindset, you know, he, he just smiles. He just goes, okay, I come fight. Good. That's it. He's just, he's just... He, he, I don't think he's going to pay you enough respect. I'm not going to lie, Bill. I think he's, I think the Russians are so heavy, you know, so forward set. And they just, they don't think about anyone else, only themselves. And that's going to be his downfall. I, I just think when yeah, he starts mixing he's it with you, he's going to be sure. He's so raw <laughs> behind closed doors, isn't it? Where it's like, there ain't gonna, we're not going to be allowed entourages. Right, it's not going to mm. be so, it's just going to be literally be like the fighter in the corner team, and maybe like one or two representatives on you know on either side of where we are. Mm. And it's just going to be so raw, like Tony said, when the bell goes and it's pure silence, you know, and you yeah. can hear the thudding of those 10 ounce gloves. And like, trust me, like, when you stuff. hear them hit him to the body, you I'm telling you now, Pavekin's going to make a noise. Just remember, yeah. I've said this when you hear him hit him to the Dylan's a, good, a very, very good body punch, especially it's unseen in the heavyweight division these days. But people go on the body like Dylan does. When you hit Pavek into the body, I'm gonna say, Remember, I said this, wait till you hear the noise from him, and he's gonna find out what it's like when you go against a big ass heavyweight who can punch. You, you, you know, the thing is, I agree with what you're saying, but the thing is, Pavek is technically good. Oh, That's good. one thing I give yeah. him, he's technically sound. You know, but um, and, and he's so out tough guys because he just keeps coming forward and he just keeps mm. working. But 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 yeah, yeah, listen, when I hit him and I will hit him, I'm gonna try, I'm gonna try and hit him as hard as I can, as soon as I can. You know, obviously they see me inside and they're thinking, ah, oh, yeah, you know, obviously I was a bit slow, I was a bit cumbersome, obviously. But but they 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 will see a complete different. Dylan White, you know what I mean? As it stands, I'm already in good nick now. And, and um, you know, I'm only going to get better and better. I'm just waiting for Eddie to pull the trigger on the date now so I can up my training. Won't be long. Won't be long. Listen, mate, I appreciate yeah, you coming in, my content. friend. And I'll catch you uh, catch you this week. We've got a few bits of fun and games. I think we've got me and you got a comic relief KFC cook-off tomorrow or something, haven't we? Or Tuesday I now? think so. Can, can you even cook, Eddie? No. <laughs> you can. I see you all the time marinating the old chicken. I'm banging trouble. Well, you never know, mate. Never know. You're going to be they getting five stars from the Colonel, mate. They might give us something <laughs> easy. Let's see. Exactly. All right, mate. Feels good to see right. you. Have a good day. Respect, Catch guys. Soon, Cheers, Take mate. Cheers. Easy. Cheers. In a bit. Well, I've got to say, and you know I'm low on confidence, another unbelievable show. How we haven't been picked up by a major network yet, I don't know. It's only a matter of time. Two great guests, Tony, in, in Darren and, uh, and Dillian White. 
Yeah, two good guys who uh, always just want to fight. And that's the most important thing in the combat sport business, mate, that you meet a guy, you speak to them, and the most important thing to them is not money, not titles, not anything, just they want to fight. And that's what we got today on the show. We did. Well, thanks for joining us, everyone. Great show. We'll see you for episode four next week. Stay home-ish, but most of all, stay safe. <laughs>